Good evening, everyone. Today we're now going to move to chapter 28 of our textbook. This title is in chapter Resurrection and Ascension. Just as a reminder, the title of our textbook is Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have to come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together this evening to study your word and learn the doctrine, to learn your doctrines, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that whatever comes out of my mouth tonight, Lord, is of your spirit, not of my soul, not of my mind, but, Lord, of completely of your spirit, Heavenly Father. I pray you would move upon me with your spirit tonight, Heavenly Father, that it would be you teaching, Lord, through me, Heavenly Father, not me teaching my own opinions, Lord, but that you teaching your perfect wisdom, Heavenly Father, and teaching your word and your doctrine. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Just as a brief review, um, our goal in this study is to teach a methodical, systematic, and categorical study of the Word of God to receive and apply God's thoughts. And our memory verse, we do have a memory verse for this class, it's Isaiah chapter 28 verses 9 to 10, which I'm sure all of us know very well by now. <laughs> but to whom will he teach knowledge, and to whom will he explain the message? Those, those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So, as we state every class, our definition for doctrine is that we see it as the teaching of God's thoughts. Doctrine is, simply stated, God's thoughts. Not ours, but his thoughts. Especially as they are communicated through his word. And we also, in our study of doctrine, want to avoid teaching what is called non-systematic doctrine. Too many times we have a tendency as human beings to teach what comes out of our own minds and what comes out of our own soul. It comes when we tend to manufacture doctrine by proof texting, which is a process where we take one or a few scriptures to form our doctrine instead of consulting the Bible as a whole, which is what we should be doing when we study the Bible. In teaching systematic doctrine, we make sure our teachings, teachings are accurate, not to one, not to a few, but the entirety of the Bible. So in our previous class, we wrapped up our discussion on the atonement by discussing two of its most important aspects, Christ's perfect obedience and his necessary suffering. As a review, we stated, Jesus, we stated that Jesus' perfect obedience to God's will and his law were mandatory for him to earn our atonement because his sacrifice was to be one that was perfect and spotless. Otherwise, he would not have been able to save us through his death. Also, we discussed the many sufferings of Christ and why each of them were also necessary for the atonement. These sufferings included complete abandonment, psychological trauma, physical torture, and spiritual separation from God. This and much more did Christ suffer for our salvation, a way of escape from God's righteous wrath that he bore, yet we deserved. Now that we have finished our discussion on the atonement, we will now turn to a new chapter in our textbook and begin discussing the doctrines of Christ's resurrection and ascension. Especially concerning the former, these doctrines are pivotal beliefs that play a crucial role in our salvation and God's plans for the future. In this class, we will discuss various topics concerning the resurrection, including its evidence, nature, and doctrinal significance. We will also devote the rest of our class time to studying Christ's ascension. So to begin our class tonight, we will start with the evidence for Christ's resurrection. As with any doctrine, it is imperative that we understand that the scriptures need to be the foundation of what we teach. Fortunately, an abundance of scripture, scripture passages discuss the resurrection. Specifically, Christ's resurrection is clearly described in all four Gospels. Specifically, it can be found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 20, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, Luke chapter 1, or chapter 24, verses 1 to 53, and John chapter 20, verse 1, to chapter 21, verse 25. 
So uh, we don't have time, obviously, to read all of these, and many of them, for that matter. But we're going to take some time to review the first 10 verses of Matthew's account. So starting in Matthew chapter um, 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, or the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. They, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took a hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they may see me. In addition to the four accounts of the gospel, the rest of the New Testament not only proclaims, but also is the direct result of Christ's resurrection. For example, the book of Acts sees the Apostle Paul and the other believers proclaiming Christ not, to, not as a dead man, but as the one who conquered death through his resurrection and provides eternal life and salvation for all those who believe in him. Also, the epistles were written not as letters that uphold a dead Savior, but a living Redeemer who is worthy of our faith, praise, and submission as his church's head. Finally, the book of Revelation shows Christ as not only alive, but also returning to reign over it in a time that has not yet come to pass. While there, were, while there are also historical arguments, as Grudem notes, that have convinced many of the veracity of the gospel's message of Christ's resurrection, what is important, especially for our purposes, is that the scriptures, as the inerrant word of God, proclaim Christ not as a dying man still hanging on a cross or as one lying dead in a tomb, but as one who died for our sins and conquered death as he exited his grave and ascended into heaven. We will now discuss the nature of Christ's resurrection. <clears throat> so we will now turn to our, we will now turn our discussion to address Christ's resurrected state. It is first important to note that when Jesus rose from the grave three days following his death on the cross, he did not simply come back to life. What do I mean by this? This is referring to the fact that Jesus not only came to life, came back to life, but also received a new kind of body. If Jesus has simply come back to life in the same manner as Lazarus and the other people he raised from the dead during his ministry, Jesus would still have been in his original, original physical body. This would have been problematic because Christ would not only have been subjected to the common physical weaknesses of humanity, he would have also died again at a later time. Instead, Jesus' resurrection resulted in our Lord receiving, as Grudem notes, a new kind of human life, which means he received a perfect, immortal body that was completely immune to death and suffering. Being the first to receive this new kind of body, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 23 explain, But in fact Christ has been, risen from the, has been raised from the dead. Excuse me the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. <clears throat> Thus, Christ's resurrection was far more than Jesus simply coming back to life. It but resulted in him receiving a new life 
and new glorified body that was immortal and perfected. Also, Jesus' resurrected form was not a solely spiritual manifestation, but also saw him possessing a physical body. This is proven with multiple scripture references. For example, the disciples were recorded to have touched him following his resurrection, as we read tonight in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 to 9. But the angel said to the woman, do not, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to, from, going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them there, and said, or met them, and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. The same, can, the same can be seen where, where Jesus tells his disciple Thomas to touch his hands and his side, where he was scarred from his crucifixion, as seen in John chapter 20, verse 27. Furthermore, Jesus was capable of doing things that physical people were also able to do. Examples of this include him taking and breaking bread with some of his disciples in Luke chapter 24, 24 verse 30, cooking food for his disciples in John chapter 21, verses 12 to 13, and ate food according to the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, verse 41. Final, I'm sorry, finally, Jesus explicitly states that his resurrected form is more than simply a spiritual one. For in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, he states, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see as I have. For a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see as I have. Thus, Jesus' resurrected resurrection resulted in him receiving a new glorified body that could physically interact with other people and physical objects on this earth. We will now discuss the doctrinal significance of Christ's resurrection. Now that we understand the nature of Christ's resurrected state, we will now focus on how his resurrection is doctrinally significant to believers today. The following are some of the many ways in which the resurrection is doctrinally, doctrinally significant to us. First, Christ's resurrection ensures our re regeneration. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read, We have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In this verse, the Apostle Peter is associating our new birth upon receiving salvation to Christ's resurrection. How are these two things connected? Grudem explains that when Jesus was resurrected, he received a new form of life, as we previously discussed. In addition to it providing, providing him immortality, it also gave him a, new, a glorified human body and spirit that were perfectly suited for fellowship and obedience to God. Through his resurrection, Christ earned this new type of life for all those who receive his salvation. How do we receive this new life from the resurrected Christ? While believers, while believers will still live in their current bodies as long that remain, while believers will still live in their current bodies as long as they are alive on this earth that remain vulnerable to sickness, weakness, and death. The new resurrection power Jesus earned for us is received upon salvation, where it makes our spirits alive and filled with his power. The Apostle Paul states in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, and what, is and what is the immeasurable power or greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in, in the heavenly places. Also in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Finally, in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 11, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Jesus Christ. Through the new life Christ imparts to us through our spirits, we receive the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that enables us to serve in ministry, preach the gospel, overcome sin and our enemies, and become more Christ-like. Thus, through his resurrection, we are not only regenerated, but are also empowered through the same power that brought Christ back to life. Another, do- another, uh, another significant doctrine concerning Christ's resurrection is, is that it ensures our justification. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, the Apostle Paul states, referring to Jesus, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. When Jesus was raised from the grave, it indicated that God the Father approved of his son's redemptive work for sinful mankind. Grudem explains that because Jesus, as Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 states, humbles and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, God has highly exalted him as stated in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, indicating that God considered his son's work not only favorable, but also finished, thus no longer requiring his death. Thus, it could be said that Jesus' resurrection was the final proof that he had earned our justification. In addition, Christ's resurrection ensures that we will receive perfect resurrected bodies as well. Several verses in Scripture note that all believers will one day receive new bodies similar to the one that Jesus received following his resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, we read, And God raised the Lord, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us up. Bring us with you into his presence. However, the most extensive discussion on this topic lies in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 58, which is a passage, a passage that we unfortunately do not have the time to read in full tonight. Nevertheless, among the most important of these verses is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, which we read early in this class, but to repeat it here, Paul states that Christ is the first of those who have fallen asleep, indicating how Christ's resurrection is the first of many that have yet to take place. Finally, Christ's resurrection should influence influence us daily. In addition to the doctrines we previously discussed, the resurrection of Christ should affect our daily lives. For example, the Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. At the end of that long passage concerning the resurrection that we just talked about, Paul ends it by encouraging us to be steadfast in our work for God's kingdom. This is true because everything that we do to, to bring people into the kingdom and build them up will have eternal significance, which is all possible because we have the power to affect others' eternity through Christ's resurrection power. Also, the Apostle Paul encourages us to focus our, on our heavenly rewards as we consider the resurrection. As we read in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1-4, to 4, If you then have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seating at, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Finally, we should focus on applying the resurrection power of Christ to overcome sin. The apostle, or Paul states in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 to 13, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Jesus Christ, alive to God in Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. 
do, but do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Because we possess the power to overcome sin, Christ's resurrection should encourage us to abstain from it and live in the new life Christ run for us on Calvary. Our final topic tonight will discuss will involve discussing the ascent, Christ's ascension into heaven. We will be giving a brief overview of the doctrines concerning this topic. What is not it's arguably it is not as doctrinally significant concerning our salvation as the resurrection is. It is still an interesting and important topic worth discussing. Our points on the res, our points on the ascension include the following: Christ ascended to a place. Following Jesus living on earth in his glorified resurrected body for 40 days, Jesus, while in the midst of his followers, and as Luke chapter 24 verses 50 to 51 state, he lifted up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. As this name implies, Jesus' Jesus's ascension involves him departing from the earth upwards, and as the account in Acts states, he ascended into a cloud that took him, that took him out of his, father, of his followers' sight. Also, Christ received glory and honor that had not been his before as the God-man. Based on various references from Scripture, it can be said that after Christ ascended and returned to heaven, that he received glory and honor that had, was once not his before. For example, many verses, such as Acts chapter 2, verse 33, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, show that the Father had highly exalted his Son, which are writings that were given after his ascension. Furthermore, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, describe Christ as being taken up in glory. Finally, Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, and in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, the angels praise him with these words. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Thus, in his state as the glorified God-man, Christ received additional honor, glory, and authority following his ascension to heaven. In addition, Christ was seated at God's right hand. One of the most notable aspects of Christ's additional honor was that he assumed a seat at the right hand of God the Father. Such was predicted in multiple Old Testament prophecies, such as Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, where it is stated, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 tells us of these prophecies' fulfillment. When he, when he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. As Grudem states, as Grudem states, this welcoming into the presence of God and sitting at God's right hand is a dramatic indication of the completion of Christ's work of redemption. Just as a human would sit down upon the completion of some large task to enjoy the satisfaction of his completion, so Jesus sat at the right hand of his Father, demonstrating the finished state of his work of redemption. Furthermore, this act of sitting at God's right hand indicates the additional authority we received following his ascension. For example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, we read, God raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, which indicates his rulership over all creation. Also in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, 20 also, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22 states that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Furthermore, in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, we read of Jesus' authority over the church. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. Thus, Jesus' ascension resulted in him gaining authority over all creation, all creatures, and his church. 
we will finally discuss the doctrinal significance of Christ's ascension. Similar to the resurrection, there is much doctrine to be learned from Christ ascending into heaven and everything that took place following it. In addition to what we just discussed, Christ's ascension foreshadows how all believers will also ascend into heaven and be with him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, we read, We who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Second, Jesus' ascension assures us that our future home will be in heaven with him. In John chapter 14, verses 2 to 3, Jesus refers to how he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven, that where he is, we may also be. Finally, as Christ gains significant authority after his ascension, so shall we partially share in his authority over the universe. Multiple verses in scripture note the authority believers receive from Christ, including that in spiritual warfare with the devil and his demons, and what we will receive in the future, such as judging angels and ruling aside, alongside him when he returns to earth. Thus, the ascension has much spiritual significance for believers. The resurrection and the ascension are two crucial topics of doctrine that hold great significance for believers today. By meditating on the truths and the promises we have received from them, we can increase our dependence on Christ's resurrection power and sovereign authority that can enable us to overcome sin, wage successful spiritual warfare, and bring many souls to Christ.